Okay, uh, this is going to be something of a double act, as uh, John Beddington has described. Uh, the project is focused on the terms mental capital and mental well-being. Um, I'm uh, Tom Kirkwood. I'm director of the Institute for Aging and Health uh, at Newcastle University and have ha had the privilege and pleasure of uh, leading the work on uh, mental capital through life. I'll be talking about mental capital and what that means, and then Felicia Huppert will talk about mental well-being. Now, um, as John said, when one first hears the term mental capital, and this happened to me, uh, I suppose, a couple of years ago when I was asked to become involved in this, uh, you know, sort of there's a moment of head scratching and you think, you know, sort of, what's it all about? But actually the term was rather beautifully crafted because although there are layers of complexity, it does do pretty much what it suggests at first impression and the, the parallel has been suggested of thinking of this in terms of the bank account of the mind um, it's not a bad parallel but I think one of the beauties of mental capital as opposed to our dwindling personal bank accounts is that mental capital is not used up by applying it by spending it <coughs> so in fact uh, there is evidence that you can enhance and preserve it by actually putting it to work uh, so, so the concept is not of something which is limited uh, in the way that money in a bank account may be limited, but it is a very important resource. And I think what we need to appreciate, and this comes out very strongly in the report as a whole, is that we must focus on the concept of mental capital being something to be nurtured in its trajectory through our life course. So, we are born, effectively, with no mental capital. We have capabilities, but we don't have anything in the bank yet. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is to understand how mental capital is nurtured and supported uh, in the early years of life and then through education. And then as we sort of emerge into society as fully-fledged adults uh, and put our minds to work for our own benefit and for the benefit of society, how we continue to sort of push that trajectory upwards and then keep it as high as we possibly can through the life course. Now then, uh, the part that I'm particularly interested in, given my own research area, is what happens later on. And the extraordinary thing about the circumstances of life today in the 21st century is that life expectancy is getting longer and longer and longer. And this, uh, far from being a time bomb that threatens to destroy society is the product of uh, the ingenuity of previous generations, but it sure does present some challenges. And those challenges are, one, how to avoid the downward trend of the trajectory that arises from the ageing process itself, and we'll be hearing more about that later. And the other is how to avoid the all-too-prevalent problems that arise from the failure of individuals and society to make the most of the mental capital that is in the heads, minds of people as they come into later life. So, I will, um, I should have uh, advanced the slide a moment ago, um, and I will now hand over to Felicia who will talk about mental capital, mental well-being. Right, I'm Felicia Huppert, Director of the uh, Wellbeing Institute at Cambridge University. Mental well-being um, is a dynamic state and it's a combination of feeling good and functioning effectively. So it describes the extent to which an individual utilises their potential, builds good relationships, learns effectively, works productively, and it's enhanced, as, as it says here, by the fulfilment of personal and social goals which give people a sense of purpose in their lives. Now, what Clearly, the extent to which one can have well-being is also influenced in part by external conditions. And external conditions can either be supportive of well-being or hinder it. Uh, think about a school. A school can either support the development of a child's curiosity, build on their strength, their love of learning, or hinder them, and the same in a workplace. But the important thing about what the report does, what the definition is about, is mental, uh, mental well-being <laughs> sorry, as, as a state of flourishing. A positive state, not merely the absence of symptoms. Now, there are times in an individual's life where they flourish, other times where they're not doing so well. But also, if you look at it across the population, at any one time, about 16% of us have a mental health problem. But there are many people who are not flourishing, though they may not have a identifiable problems. They're languishing. 
they're not functioning well, they may be too stressed to function effectively, they may feel empty or hollow. And what this is partly about is how can one move those people into a state of flourishing, which is good for them, for families, for work, and for everything. So it's not just about tackling problems, it's about looking at the whole population, how can we move people towards flourishing? And even a tiny shift in the population level of flourishing could have enormous benefits for the whole population. And just a final word about the relationship specifically between mental capital and mental well-being. They're clearly both very important for our path through life. And therefore, it's especially important in the early stages to ensure that children develop as much mental capital as possible and have a high level of well-being. There's also links between them. So, for example, people who have positive uh, approaches to life or in positive mental states um, are better able to utilise their mental capital. They are more curious, more creative, more ready to learn. And the other way around goes, uh, is also the case. Mental capital affects well-being. Uh, for example, an aspect of mental capital that we'll hear about later, uh, executive function, is about self-regulation and the extent to which we can regulate our behaviour, including our social behaviour and our emotional behaviour, has tremendously important consequences for success in relationships, success at work and so forth. So, uh, across the whole population, we believe mental capital, mental well-being can be improved, but there are also special uh, groups which have problems that have to be tackled, and the report recognises that as well. So I'd like to hand over to Usha, who's going to talk about one particular problem group.